Thank you, Andy. Thank you, everybody. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be uh, lecturing at the, uh, or for the Adam Smith Institute. And uh, it, it really uh, it thrills me to have an opportunity to, to speak on the subject that, uh, that I wish Adam Smith himself had said more about and to uh, perhaps uh, argue that, uh, that, uh, that, that uh, by omitting to be more conscious of the monopoly that was developing at the time that he wrote The Wealth of Nations, uh, Adam Smith missed a great opportunity to spare us from what would turn out, in fact, to be one of the most disastrous monopolies in the history of modern economics. Now, when I was originally approached about speaking, I was asked to give a talk that would provide something of a primer or crash course in pre-banking. Well, that's kind of hard to do, and, and I had another idea instead. And my idea was that in, rather than speak about how uh, a monetary system could work without state control, I would speak about how it is that governments managed to take control of money in the first place. How did government currency monopolies end up surviving as other kinds of monopolies were almost universally condemned? Uh, and what I'm going to argue is that currency monopolies uh, have survived despite being essentially medieval arrangements. Uh, they have survived into the modern era uh, thanks to a combination of political accidents and mistaken economic theory. Now, my talk today is going to consist largely of a talk about what happened to monopolies generally in early modern English history, and then it's going to be a talk about why this didn't happen to monopolies in currency, including the monopoly of coinage and the monopoly of paper money. So let me first start by observing that government-sponsored monopolies were once very, very common. The crown considered it its right to, establishment, to establish them whenever and wherever it saw fit. Uh, it was seen, this right to create monopolies, as a central component of the royal prerogative. And the use or the abuse of the privilege of creating monopolies is one that reached a height in late Tudor and early Stuart times. For example, under Elizabeth, there was, and I quote uh, from a, a leading authority on this period in economic history, there was scarcely a commodity which was not the object of a monopoly. A list of some, the complete list is too long for me to read, of some goods that were monopolized under, uh, during the Tudor, late Tudor period includes salt, sailcloth, playing cards, soap, saltpeter, sulfur, alum, oil, glass, starch, paper, vinegar, powder flasks, spangles, mathematical instruments, fish livers, I'm not sure what you do with a monopoly of fish livers, glasses, and beer for export. That's just some of the items. Uh, they were all subject to royal patents. And uh, it's very clear that the motive for the existence of all these monopolies was pecuniary. Uh, and blatantly so, they were used, especially by Elizabeth, as a way of awarding servants and court favorites, and essentially anyone who she felt like rewarding, either as payment for a, a favor done or otherwise as, uh, as a way of perhaps uh, 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 returning a debt. Uh, <clears throat> and um, also, these monopolies were granted for the sake of enhancing the royal revenues because the, the uh, crown needed an income. And it couldn't always rely on parliament to give it one. And uh, indeed, uh, parliament was pretty stingy. And for this reason, uh, in Tudor times, particularly 
it became more and more common for monopoly grants to be treated as a way of financing the royal household. There was, correspondingly, a uh, very vigorous prosecution of anyone who infringed upon any of these royal monopolies because they were essentially threatening the income of, of the crown. And uh, infringement was considered uh, an instance of contempt of the royal prerogative. And thus, uh, a pretext existed for dealing with people who infringed upon monopolies in the star chamber where a verdict, a, a verdict of guilty was pretty much a foregone conclusion. Uh, now, it's true that uh, as a sort of smokescreen for establishing all these monopolies, it was argued that they were being created not for the purpose of returning favors to courtiers and such, but as a way to encourage new industry and blah, blah, blah. But everyone saw through this. It was very obvious that new industries were not being created. Uh, and indeed, it became, it became notorious that the pervasive monopolies that Elizabeth had created had had what we would now consider the predictable effect of undermining prosperity, English prosperity, and destroying economic opportunities. In fact, things got so bad that uh, a parliament was led towards the end of Elizabeth's reign to lodge increasing protests against the abuse of the prerogative to create monopolies. Uh, and uh, this was really quite remarkable given the overall lack of power in the parliament at that time, that they should dare to protest. And indeed, uh, though, so the general public outcry against monopolies, particularly from the rising middle class, was such as to actually uh, give Parliament the feeling that they had the whole of England behind them. And so uh, uh, the mounting opposition of the Parliament caused a reaction against monopolies. Uh, there was one uh, session in Parliament, I think this was in the late uh, 1590s, where the list of monopolies was read out. And it just took a long, long time. And at one point, one of the MPs uh, said, uh, uh, what about bread? Isn't bread on the list? And everybody else shouted out, bread, what do you mean? And he said, well, yes, I assure you, if affairs go on at this rate, we shall have bread reduced to a monopoly before the next parliament. So you had a move to suppress uh, to put an end to the abuse of monopolies and the creation of monopolies. And the evidence was overwhelming that every one of them did harm. Prices for every good that was monopolized went up, quality went down, in some cases quality deteriorated dramatically. Uh, and uh, as Herman Levy, uh, who has written the classic work on the subject of the competition of monopoly in England, has, wrote, has noted, the greatest caution cannot blind one to the conclusion that the expansion of England's industrial productivity can only have suffered by the system of monopoly, and that that system had not been adopted. If that system had not been adopted, the growth of England's industrial wealth might certainly have been greater. So, finding the entire country behind it, we really have a problem with the lighting here, huh? I wonder if it's uh, on a timer. I can see, barely. Finding the nation behind it uh, and uh, having overwhelming evidence of the damage that Monopoly was doing, uh, Parliament prepared legislation uh, to, to restrict the prerogative, to force Queen Elizabeth, essentially, to stop granting these monopolies. And Elizabeth, in 1601, uh, anticipating this legislative attack on her prerogative, issued her own peremptory proclamation against monopolies. Rather than see Parliament challenge her monopoly, she, she uh, tried to head them off at the pass. And with this proclamation of 1601, Elizabeth summarily revoked all of the most obnoxious patents, quite a few of her monopolies, she left the rest to be adjudicated by common law courts instead of the star chamber, which is where they had been uh, adjudicated. And most importantly, she claimed 
that she had only intended to create these monopolies to serve the common good and uh, that their projectors had deceived her. And this essentially created a principle that would be important throughout the whole Stuart era when monopolies were really going to be finally suppressed, uh, that uh, harmful monopolies were ipso facto illegitimate. Right? So if the, mo mo if the monopoly couldn't be shown to benefit the public, and there was no justification for it. It was, it was not consistent with the royal prerogative according to what Elizabeth had said. Right? Oh, I'm only doing this one. I meant the, for the common good, right? Well, uh, under James I, the Elizabeth 1601 proclamation became a dead letter. Right? He uh, ended up creating even more monopolies than Elizabeth had, uh, contributing to a new uh, slump, 1620, bad economic slump, and provoking renewed parliamentary opposition. And this ultimately gave rise in 1624 to the famous Statute of Monopoly. Now, this statute has two parts. The first part is an emphatic condemnation of all monopolies. That's the good part. The second part kind of leaves the door open by creating essentially two, two loopholes. First, it allows for monopolies for new inventors. And this, of course, would become the basis for English and later American patent law. Well, that, that part's not so bad, even if you're opposed to patents. It's not the worst. Then it created a loophole for corporations, and that was a, a bigger, more easy to abuse. Well, both of these things, both of these loopholes were very badly abused uh, under uh, Charles I. So even though we have this statute, under Charles I, uh, there was yet another round of abuse of monopolies as, uh, as he tried desperately to manage without parliament, to secure his own income without parliamentary support. This is the so-called peri the period of personal government. And he created all kinds of new monopolies just for the revenue so he didn't have to call parliament to get uh, funds from them. Um, and as Clarendon observes in his history of the rebellion, Projects of all kinds, many ridiculous, many scandalous, all very grievous, were set in motion. All pretense of the public good, of serving the public good, uh, was abandoned. In fact, Charles went so far at this time to put his monopoly concessions up for auction. So instead of saying, well, here, you can have this monopoly, you can have this monopoly, he would get everybody together who would be all interested in monopoly, and he would auction it to the highest bidder. This is the best way to maximize the revenue take, right? So, I mean, the no pretense of public good is, is out, right? This is all about maximizing revenue. Um, but, of course, ultimately, Charles' attempt at personal government failed. He had to call parliament. First you had the short parliament, and then he dissolved, and then you had the long parliament. And the long parliament now make, goes on the attack again against monopolies, and uh, it summarily cancels all of Charles' monopolies, and uh, this is in 1640. Not only that, anybody who had taken any part in any of the monopolies is, is disqualified from serving in parliament. And the existing parliamentarians who had had a hand in any, uh, in any of the monopolies are, uh, are literally tossed, tossed out of the common. And that's, if, you had any, if you touched any of these monopolies, if you had a share, you're out of the government. Uh, finally, in 1689, right, the Bill of Rights, first the Declaration and ultimately the Bill of Rights, uh, enshrines the principles set uh, forth uh, by the Long Parliament. And so within the scope of about, let, well, let's say, a century, uh, Parliament had largely done away with a system of monopoly that uh, would continue to flourish in most other countries. They would, in most other countries, the prerogative of establishing monopolies would continue to be used extensively for another hundred years. England was the first place to basically get rid of monopoly as a normal way uh, of running business. Right? Uh, and uh, again, according to Levy, uh, during the whole of the 18th century, I quote, no national monopoly based on legal privilege any longer existed in any industry. Adam Smith, whose detestation of monopoly was all-embracing, would certainly have noticed any such abomination. Well, of course, uh, Adam Smith did fail to notice two monopolies that escaped uh, Parliament's dragnet. 
These were the monopoly of coinage in the, uh, that uh, was possessed by the Royal Mint's company of moneyers. And uh, uh, the other was the monopoly of currency, which was then still taking root at the Bank of England. It wasn't quite there, but it was forming. And in fact, uh, for reasons I'll get into, uh, Smith did not attack either of these and indeed didn't really notice the second monopoly at all. Yet, yet, of all possible monopolies, none harbored so much potential for damage, for mischief, as these two monopolies in coinage. Uh, the case of, coin, uh, of monopolies of currency, the, the damage that could be done from a monopoly of coinage was all too apparent from history. That uh, harbored by monopoly of paper currency vested in the central bank was, of course, yet to be uh, uh, fully uh, appreciated, but would become clear enough. So the question I want to address is, not so much why did Parliament, why did Parliament not stamp out the coinage monopoly and, and, and prevent the establishment of the uh, Bank of England, which would ultimately have a paper currency monopoly, but why did the economists not uh, act to prevent them from uh, escaping parliamentary strictures? Because we have to remember, this is very important, I didn't realize this until I started studying the subject, that um, you know, the economists' condemnation of monopoly was not something that they came up with. Monopolies had been roundly condemned in England by the public and by parliament before political economists started to do their thing as far as indicating just what it is that was harmful about monopolies and how competition uh, prevented it. The economists simply were repeating <coughs> what was already conventional wisdom, that is, economists in, say, the, say the 17th and certainly the 18th century. So, but what economists could do, of course, was to see to it that Parliament didn't leave any monopolies untouched that were harmful. And that did not happen in the case of these two monopolies. And one reason is, again, that there was a sense in which people were simply overlooked them. They overlooked them. Well, I read you that passage from Levy, the historian of monopoly and competition in England. He says there were no monopolies in the, in the 18th century. Now, this, he's a historian of this subject, right? So he obviously didn't notice that, yes, there's a coinage monopoly, and there's a growing currency monopoly, currency monopoly in the making. So he missed it. So obviously, there's something about these monopolies that causes people to not notice them. And uh, I think, paradoxically, the reasons in each case, coins and paper currency, are opposite reasons. Coinage, the monopoly in coinage, I submit, was overlooked and, and still is overlooked by many authorities because it's so ancient that they just took it for granted. It's much, much older than most of the monopolies that we've been talking about. Salt, all these other things, these are Tudor innovations, but coinage goes all the way back to ancient times, the coinage monopoly. In the case of paper currency, it got overlooked, that is, the, 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 the fact that there was a paper currency monopoly that was in formation in the 18th century, that got overlooked because it was so novel for the opposite reason. Right? Nobody really realized that, what, that, that a paper currency monopoly was in the process of being developed. And even once that became more clear, the significance of a paper currency monopoly wasn't so obvious. And that's, I'm going to talk about that. Uh, so let's go back to, this, let's talk about coinage first. So the idea of a coinage prerogative, that is prerogative to set up a coining monopoly, that dates from, in England, from pre-Norman times. And really it has its roots in uh, the institution of coinage itself, in, 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 the, in the ancient institution of coinage. Its basis was ancient tyrants' desire for a source of emergency revenue. Right? Uh, a source they could exploit when their security was threatened. It is not true, as sometimes you'll hear in textbooks, right, that coinage was, had to be monopolized because it's a natural monopoly or because the private sector can't be relied on to produce sound coins. In fact, um, uh, what little evidence there is on early coinage, going back to ancient Lydia, suggests that the earliest coins were not invented by any king. And the motive, the reason why coinage was taken over by early 
Lydian kings, some people say J.G., some others Croesus. Uh, it's only a matter of a century, so who cares? But in any event, the argument, the, usual, the, the reason they took over coinage, authorities on the subject agree, was not because they had to do it to create order in their coinage systems, but because this was a security measure. It was a security measure because whoever controlled coinage had a means for revenue that they could use to fend off rivals. And so uh, the, the prerogative of coinage really had originally a, 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 what, if you will, a, a national defense rationalization. And, and not an invalid one. I'm not questioning the fact that these, by monopolizing coinage, these tyrants were able to stay in power because they could generate a lot of revenue in a short period of time by debasing coin. Um, so coinage was monopolized since ancient times uh, for revenue purposes, for fiscal purposes, for security purposes. The example of the ancient uh, tyrants was followed by later princes, later kings, queens, uh, and especially by the more tyrannical ones and in this way, coining came over time to be regarded as a, an attribute of sovereignty. It's more than just something that is a natural part of the prerogative of governments, but it, it's an attribute of their sovereignty. Right? With other things, right? a government, the Queen Elizabeth could say, I have the prerogative, I have a, my prerogative allows me to create a salt monopoly. But when it came to coins, whoever made coins, that that, that indicated that they had some sovereign powers. So uh, rivalry in coinage was particularly antithetical to the notion of the royal prerogative and indeed to that of uh, sovereignty, royal sovereignty. Uh, so a close relationship developed between control of coin on one hand uh, and uh, sovereignty on the other, and this is why Coining without regal authority has since ancient times often been regarded as a, a treasonous activity with the penalty of death attached to it. That was the case under the Greeks, it was the case with the Romans, and it was the case in Britain until modern time. It was a capital offense. If you, if you made playing cards illegally because someone had an, a monopoly, you would, could get hauled to the star chain, but it wasn't a capital offense. So coinage has a, a status as a monopoly that's a much more, uh, let's say, deep-seated one. Now, because of this, by the time, say, in the late Middle Ages, the coining began to become a subject of learned treatises, most of the people, uh, in fact, everybody writing about it took this prerogative of coinage, the royal prerogative, for granted. It's actually funny and frustrating. There's a book by Monroe called Monetary Theory Before Adam Smith, right? And he surveys for every century, I think starting with the, uh, well, for first he starts with ancient times and then he has separate chapters for the 15th century, the 16th century, the 17th century. And he surveys the works dealing with money for all these periods. And every chapter starts sounding like the last chapter because basically he says, okay, uh, the writers of this period in their treatises spent six or seven chapters explaining all of the abuse of money, the debasements, etc., and condemning it and saying this is awful, people are really just being terribly ripped off and we need to stop this, the prince has really got to cut it out. Right? Those would be the first, say, six chapters. Chapter seven would say, but of course only the prince can be trusted to coin money. Right? So they, they just weren't able to see the inconsistency between <coughs> the record of abuse of the royal prerogative of coinage on one hand and the fact that oh, they were the only ones allowed to coin money, that they had these monopoly rights on the other. A typical example is William... Uh, Davenant, right? He has the usual chapters condemning uh, abuse of coinage, debasement, etc., by the prince. But then, when it comes to talking about who should we entrust our coinage to, he says, "Well, of course, uh, we should let the prince coin money, 
he's the only one we can trust because, after all, he's the father of us all. And uh, therefore, he's the only one we can trust. So if that gives you some idea of how even you know, in medieval times, and certainly Renaissance times, that the, the royal prerogative were simply not questioned by anyone. No matter how much abuse there was, they couldn't conceive. Writers who were very critical of this abuse of coinage couldn't conceive of how anyone else could coin money without doing an even worse job. Uh, of course, Parliament, for its part, never really attempted to challenge the monopoly of coinage. Uh, it, um, it did occasionally, it did take some tentative steps, not directly challenging the, the prerogative, right? But it took some steps by saying, look, you know, do, do, you, do you think you could stop debasing the coin, right? In 1346, for example, uh, the Parliament did that, and the, the response of the Crown was to pointedly reject the request that the standard not be altered without consent of the Parliament uh, as, quote, an attempt to invade the royal prerogative. And that was as much as that was equivalent to saying <coughs> to the Parliament, hey, you know, you're all a bunch of usurpers, watch out. Don't even get close to this. Uh, now, there was some progress during the Stuart period. Uh, the Parliament did uh, eventually wrest control of coinage to, in, in 1642, and it, abused, it removed at that time the worst abuses of coinage. That was the period when you first had the introduction of gratuitous coinage. There would be no more debasement episodes after that, after the terrible debasements of, of uh, uh, Henry VIII and Edward. It, the, the, the Parliament now has taken control of coinage, and yet, even so, uh, it would never challenge the idea of a prerogative of coinage. Uh, even under Charles, uh, the, uh, the, the government continued to uh, uh, mint only putting Charles's figure on the coinage, and there were still royal, had to be a royal order for, uh, to determine the, uh, the nature of uh, the coins. So, the prerogative remained untouched. There were a few challenges, though, to the mint that emerged in later times. For a while under the Commonwealth, uh, the, uh, the Parliament took direct management of uh, coinage, took control of it from the Royal Mint. Uh, in 1780, uh, Edmund Burke, in his famous essay on economical reform, had a wonderful passage. I've got to grab my notebook here. Burke, Burke doesn't go so far as to say, well, we should let competition supply coins. But what he says is, look, you know, a mint is just a factory. There's no reason why we shouldn't allow it to be managed as such. Uh, there's no reason, in other words, I could find the quote, but I practically remember. There's no reason why uh, we should treat coinage as different from any other industry. And he actually suggested that uh, they let the Bank of England take control of coinage, which would not be my favorite solution. But he was challenging the prerogative. The idea never went anywhere. In uh, the 1790s, Matthew Bolton managed to compete with the Royal Mint supplying regal coins, and there was an episode before that of private coinage, but ultimately the, the Mint wrested control of, of monopoly control of money again. In 1849, there was a Mint report that's really worth reading. It's a scathing indictment of the Mint's inefficiency, but in the end, it sounds a lot like those medieval treatises that say, look how awful, what an awful job the government is doing with coinage, but of course, we need to reform the system, but we can't take coinage away from the Royal Mint because who else could possibly produce coins, right? So really, all the thinking on the subject is, is, is cut short from, from arriving at any real critical condemnation of monopoly, not because anybody's putting forward good arguments for uh, monopoly, but simply because no one can no one is even willing, willing to envisage, envisage the possibility 
of, of a competitive supply. Now, uh, there was one exception to this. In 1862, Herbert Spencer dared to write in Social Statics that although everyone takes control of, min of money by the government, of coin, uh, by the government for granted, in fact, there's no good reason for it. It should be thrown open to competition. The minting of coin can be handled best by free enterprise. Well, this got a response from William Stanley Jevons that was almost dismissive. And Jevons said, well, you know, Spencer, he's a smart guy, but he, here he's taken a principle of free enterprise and applied it where it can't possibly work because we know that Gresham's Law says that the bad coins will drive the good coins out of circulation. Now, the irony of Jevons's rebuttal of Spencer is twofold. First of all, he's quoting Thomas Gresham against the idea of taking control of coinage out of the government's hands. But Gresham, who first of all wasn't the real author of the law named after him, Gresham was writing to Queen Elizabeth about the phenomenon that had taken place under Henry VIII because of his debasement of the coinage, which resulted in all the better coins being taken out of the country. So Gresham was complaining about the adverse consequences of government abuse of the prerogative of coinage. And here's Jevons trying to invoke uh, uh, Gresham, uh, uh, Gresham's argument as an argument justifying the royal prerogative of coinage. Well, there's more to that uh, than uh, just that one case. Jevons also points to the issuance of private tokens as coins by, pri coin coins by private entrepreneurs during the Industrial Revolution and says, see, this was a disaster because they had all these coins and they were depreciated. And in fact, that episode, if anything, illustrates that private coinage works much, much better than government coinage. That's the subject of my latest book, so I won't go into it. I do want to say something. So in any event, no one ever really challenged. After Spencer, total science. Now, what about the Bank of England? Well, the fact that the Bank of England was established in 1694 for purely fiscal reasons is notorious, right? So we had William III wanting to fight a war with France, threatened by the Jacob Jacobite uh, forces, and he needs money, and his credit's no good. The Bank of England is created as part of the Tonnage Act. And there's one little clause in this long, essentially, budget act that creates the Bank of England. And it's going to lend all of its, its capital, 1.2 million pounds, to William III at 8% so we can fight this war. Uh, so it clearly has a fiscal motive. There's, there's no suggestion here that this is to improve the money supply, etc. So according to that old Elizabethan concept that monopoly should only be allowed if they're in the public, general public interest, it's not clear why this should be accepted. Uh, but the only people who complained at the time were the goldsmiths and a few projectors of alternative schemes. The goldsmiths are, and, and all of these complaints were dismissed as, you know, just so many jealous rivals, etc. One complaint I want to read, uh, to quote from, from you, though, because it's so prescient, it's from a fellow named John Angel, or Angel, I'm not sure which, or Argyll, sorry, a partner in one of the failed alternative schemes who was objecting not only to the institution of the Bank of England, but the very name it commanded. He says, it is the most unreasonable thing in nature to make the particle the such a monster as to carry in its belly all the cash in the kingdom and to be destructive to all future corporations and bodies politics. Well, that didn't get anywhere, of course, uh, but it was very prescient, in fact. It was way ahead of economic opinion on the subject of the bank. Economists, alas, were much slower to appreciate the dangerous concentration of power that the bank's charter would eventually uh, give it. Partly this was because the bank gained its monopoly privileges only very, very slowly. And almost, you couldn't, you could, if you weren't paying attention, you couldn't detect that it was accumulating all this monopoly power. Uh, and even such an astute observer as Adam Smith didn't detect it. In 1694, when the charter was first granted, there were no express monopoly privileges involved. Now, it's true that in the past, when, the, when Parliament granted a charter to a corporation, right, this, the tradition was, that's it. There's one charter for this business, right? That's how it operated. So there was perhaps a presumption that it would be a monopoly, but there was no actual guarantee of a monopoly. In further, in the bank's charter, the commons included a clause 
against, the aimed at securing the public against monopoly abuse. And here I'm going to read you this clause. It's very uh, uh, significant. The clause says, <clears throat> To the intent that their majesty's subjects may not be oppressed by the said corporation by their monopolizing or engrossing any sort of goods, wares, or merchandise, be it further declared that the said corporation shall not at any time deal or trade in the buying or selling of any goods, wares, or merchandise whatsoever, and every person or persons <coughs> who shall so deal shall forfeit treble the value of goods and merchandise so traded. So, what was happening here was, if the, you have here the kernel of the later very vicious distinction between banking and commerce, right? So the, what the Bank of England isn't going to deal in any goods. It can't monopolize goods. Therefore, it can't be a monopoly. The, the implicit assumption was that you don't have to worry about monopolization of money itself. And indeed, the Bank of England at that time isn't perceived as an institution that's creating money. It issues bank notes. What's that? Notes. They're not merchandise. They're not money. What are they? I don't know. Can they be monopolized? Who cares? What does that matter? Right? right? So people aren't thinking about this as a monopoly of goods. Right? They know it can't be that. And, and, and as for the significance of the, of the monopoly of banking, it's not clear who cares about that. Does that raise the price of, does it make things more expensive? Lord, what does it do? Um, so part of the problem is, it's not clear to anyone what monopoly privileges are contained in this bank. And, and, and in truth, initially, there really aren't any. But over the course of the subsequent 50 years, the first 50 years of the bank's uh, existence, it acquires more and more monopoly privileges. But even so, and, and ultimately, as you all know, it would gain the, the present total monopoly of currency supply. In fact, that didn't finally happen. You know the date when the Bank of England finally had a monopoly of all English paper currency? Not all of British paper currency. It still doesn't have that. There's still no issuing banks in England. When did the monopoly of English paper currency become complete? It wasn't that long ago. Anyone have an idea? No? It was longer ago than that. No, it was 1921. 1921, the last notes to be issued by private joint stock bank in England uh, were issued that year. So, you know, this thing is taking a long time to develop. You can hardly blame Adam Smith for writing in The Wealth of Nations, quote, the Bank of England has no other exclusive privileges except that no other banking company in England shall consist of more than six partners. That was one of the privileges it had at the time. Now, first of all, come on, Adam. I mean, the six partner rule did a lot of harm. I think it was, uh, was it Lord Liverpool? I can't remember. No, it couldn't have been Liverpool. It was a later writer uh, who wrote uh, that uh, no, what, basically what we have here is an arrangement where the only people who can have be, be bankers in England except the Bank of England are, you know, and you, you can have any sort of bank as long as it's not solid and good, right? You only have weak bank. That's what the six partner rule said. You have one strong bank. Right. And all the rest have to be weak. And of course, they fail, etc. It's rather like our restrictions on branch banking that, ex uh, that we had for many years in the U.S. Now, in 1820, I'm almost done. In 1826, <coughs> in 1826, uh, due to agitation by Thomas Joplin, the monopoly, the bank's monopoly on joint stock banking, right, the six partner rule was relaxed, and joint stock banks were able to open, but only outside of a 65 mile radius from Charing Cross. Which is a lot of that. I mean, that's you know most of the activity, economic activity, is in that circle, right? Then in 1833, uh, they went the, the the bank's monopoly suffered yet another setback. Joint stock banks were allowed in that radius, but not if they they could not issue notes if they entered in there. Again, people didn't realize. You know, they're thinking at the time, well, look, deposits are substitutes for notes. So hey, we've got competition. Yeah, they can issue notes, but they could. What what they didn't see was that. The supply of notes was like a lever that the Bank of England could use to control the total monetary conditions, first of all. And second of all, how over time, its privileged ability to issue notes in London, that is in the 65 mile radius from Charing Cross, plus uh, ultimately its opening of branches elsewhere in the country, ultimately caused banks to keep all their reserves in London and eventually caused them all, finally, in 1921, to abandon their own note issues because they couldn't compete. They just couldn't compete. So now the one person who ultimately appreciated 
where all this was headed, who could see what, had, what the monopoly privileges of the Bank of England added up to. The one economist who saw that most clearly uh, in the 19th century was Walter Badgett. Now, most people think about Badgett as the guy who said, oh, we need a lender of last resort, right? 1873, Lombard Street. But if you read, how many of you have read Lombard Street? It's a wonderful book, right? Very good, right? So central bankers will tell you, well, you see, you need us, because Walter Badgett explained that a lender of last resort is absolutely essential back in 1873, and that's why we're here. What Badgett says in Lombard Street is very explicit, is that the English system dominated by the Bank of England is a completely unnatural and dangerous system because it's resulted in all the reserves centralizing in England and the rest of the banks being utterly dependent for their survival on the Bank of England's being willing to maintain the flow of credit in times of crisis. Crisis which, by the way, were caused by the Bank of England over lending, creating booms, and ultimately triggering uh, external drains of specie that would cause a financial breakdown. So this is where the lender of last resort rule comes from. It's Badgett's way of saying how to tame a bad system. But he explicitly says that England would have been better off it had, if it had never created the Bank of England or vested it with all those monopolies. It would have been better off having a more natural, decentralized system like Scotland's. But, Badgett says, there's no point trying now in 1873 to get rid of the Bank of England. You might as well argue for getting rid of the, the monarchy. In fact, uh, today I think it's fair to say that the monarchy is more likely to be abolished than the Bank of England. So uh, Badgett gets it, but he gets it too late. And then for the next hundred years, nothing. No recognition of the, the, of the danger of these forms of monopoly. Coinage has been tamed. It's grossly inefficient. The Royal Mint is a terrible waste uh, of resources. Nevertheless, it doesn't debase the coinage anymore. Why should it? The Bank of England is so much more efficient a vehicle for uh, uh, generating emergency fiscal resources that, that the coinage is practically irre irrelevant today for that purpose. But for 100 years, no challenges. Then, of course, comes Hayek, right? 1970s, choice in currency, denationalization of money. This Hayekian revolution is really the first time that you have a concerted effort of economists uh, to challenge currency monopoly. It's not quite true, because there was a long debate in the first part of the, 18th, of the 19th century uh, about the status of the Bank of England, and there was a British free banking school. Uh, but, uh, but that flourished for a relatively short period of time, and then it died out after Peel's, Act, Peel's Bank Act of 1844, which essentially represented a victory for the proponents of monopoly. But now, since I, there's this newfound recognition that currency monopoly should be looked at with the same kind of skeptical view that monopolies of all other types have been uh, 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 judged uh, with since Elizabethan times. So we we're way, way behind. We've got a lot of work to do. But I, I submit to you that although I haven't tried to make a case for free banking and currency competition, I hope that by seeing the ways in which uh, currency monopolies escaped the general censure of monopoly, you might see why it's worth taking the possibility of competition in currency more seriously, why it shouldn't be dismissed as simply an idea that's not even worth thinking about. It is sheer, uh, a sheer oversight that economists failed to critically attack and, and at least assess these particular medieval type monopolies and it's an oversight that they still are in our that, that we still have them in our midst. Thank you. I think here's how I understand uh, what brought Hayek to this point. I don't think that he uh, merely offered his proposal tongue in cheek or as a kind of a desperate way to get to draw attention to the harm that central banks were doing. I think rather that
Like, like Badgett, until the inflation got really bad, Hayek thought this just there's just no point talking about this. There's no point pushing uh, for a debate on uh, coinage monopolies, on current paper currency monopolies, because uh, it's so entrenched. It's so counter to what everybody has come to believe over centuries of indoctrination that it'll be, it's pointless to make that argument. In fact, we know that Hayek was quite aware of the debates in history concerning competition and coinage, the possibility of that versus monopoly, because his student Vera Smith in 1936 uh, published her dissertation on the rationale of central banking. So Hayek had known about the possibility of uh, uh, the workability of, of currency competition long before he wrote those pamphlets. But I think finally, as inflation got so bad, he thought, well, maybe now I can make this point that we should consider competition, that we should not be complacent about currency monopolies, uh, and, not that, and not be perceived as a complete nutcase because central banks are performing they're so egregiously badly, right? It would have been like somebody during the debasements of Henry VIII saying, well, now this is so bad that I'm daring to propose it. Maybe the prince shouldn't be trusted with coinage, right? Except back then, of course, you risk being uh, accused of, 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 uh, of, uh, uh, of les majestés or whatever, right? Because you're, you're challenging a, a royal prerogative, and that was a lot more dangerous than Hayek in 1976 challenging central bank monopoly. So no, I don't think it was what Habeler says. I think he just felt that this time perhaps people are fed up enough to take this argument seriously for once. Well, uh, Steve, your question, uh, get, first of all, gives me an opportunity to clarify something very important. Uh, uh, in the days when Adam Smith was writing, and, and right up until uh, 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 the early 20th century, uh, the, the era of fiat money, really, uh, to argue the case for competition in currency, for letting persons other than the Bank of England or corporations other than the Bank of England issue their own paper currency was equivalent to moving away from centralized control of the money supplied by the Bank of England. Right? The Bank of England was able to co control the money supply despite the existence of a gold standard because its notes, being the only notes around, right, or the best notes around uh, under the restrictions in place, were treated by other banks as reserves, as substitutes for gold that served as reserves instead of gold. And this allowed the Bank of England to p play a Pied Piper role in the economy, leaving all the system in an inflationary episode and then contracting to save itself and driving the whole system into ruin. Once you had fiat money, as you do today, right, competitive note issue, whether it's by communists or capitalists or otherwise, doesn't challenge the folk, doesn't attack the fulcrum of control that the central bank now possesses. Fiat money has changed that. So, um, <coughs> the, the, so the first thing I want to say is, even if uh, we had capitalists or communists issuing redeemable notes like the Princeton notes and doing so on a large scale, we'd still have a problem of controlling the Bank of England. It would still operate the fulcrum that determines the scale of money creation generally. Uh, now, uh, assuming we can put some restraints on that, what about capitalists' interest in private currency? Uh, and I think the, the answer is that unfortunately the very capitalists who are best positioned to take advantage of this and maybe make headway against the government's monopoly are also the ones who are least likely to dare to do so because they would be, uh, so to speak, their, their very success would draw upon them the wrath of the authorities. And it doesn't take much success. In a week and a half, I'll go as a witness to a trial of Bernard von Nauhaus and some of his fellow employees who were, have been charged with violating the law against issuing coins, private coinage, in the United States. It's a big deal. They confiscated all their possessions. And, uh, and uh, I'll testify and try to help uh, save 
Bernard's neck, but, uh, and so will a bunch of us who are going up there. But this was what happened to an entrepreneur who merely issued little coins of gold and silver called Liberty Dollars that nobody could seriously think of as aiming at replicating the official coins of the United States. Since there are no official gold or silver coins anymore, there are commemorative coins, so at worst you could be said to infringe upon the mint's monopoly of commemoratives, right? Uh, nevertheless, they raided his facilities, they bankrupted him, they took everything, and uh, are now taking him to court uh, with serious criminal charges. So imagine how many capitalists would like to issue banknotes, right? Uh, faced with the possibility of, of, of the state, you know, stepping in. This is what I mean when I speak of the anachronism of state-controlled money. It's not just that we have essentially medieval <coughs> arrangements for supplying currency, right? It's also we have uh, not quite the uh, legal treatment of people, of infringers, that we had in medieval times, but still we have a pretty drastic set of of penalties faced by anyone who dares to challenge this monopoly. Penalties that don't have uh, counterparts in, in, in any other field. If I violate someone's patent, right, I'm never going to be accused of a crime. I'm not going to have civil forfeit forfeiture of all my worldly goods. But coinage, the only way you can understand the status of it is to realize that it's essentially on a medieval that basis. That we, have, we have these medieval institutions that we put up with and even think are scientific because we don't know the history of how they got through the parliamentary and uh, classical liberal uh, uh, dragnet against monopoly. That is why, as far as I'm concerned, there is no point in promoting reform in this direction. What is worth promoting is education, so that uh, one can hope to, us to educate enough people. And let's face it, some people have uh, more powerful voices in this regard than others. It's not simply a question of the popular opinion. But in particular, it's a question of the expert opinion. We can get more experts to stop talking about money as if it was utterly unlike other goods, as if the theories appropriate to it and the proper administration of it was not at all like what we consider to be proper administration of most things. We can get economists in particular to, 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 you know, to see more clearly what monopoly means in currency and what competition could mean. I think we could make progress of a sort that would allow reform not only to get through, but would reduce the probability of regulations then taking over in a way that undermine the, the merits of that reform. That but, hasn't worked in any other industry. Yeah, but <coughs> one keeps trying, you know. But it, it, it is something, it is a rear, obviously a rear guard action in this case, and, uh, but I, I don't know uh, uh, the only reason I persevere is because uh, I don't see any better route, uh, any better way of trying to improve things. Uh, we will get regulation of our existing arrangements. We can at least hope to have better arrangements for the regulators to interfere with, uh, including arrangements that give greater scope for the private sector to to innovate and improve upon what the state has been doing. Sorry, there's a long question. Yeah, I, I don't know if I can remember all of it. <laughs> uh, first of all, I, I, I too have my uh, uh, fine uh, uh, problems with Hayek's proposal. I don't think his scheme for competing fiat monies was really workable. I, I think it's almost an oxymoron competing fiat money, private fiat monies. 
Uh, there's a reason why the only fiat monies we've ever known have been issued by uh, government authorities. So to that extent, I agree with you. Uh, I also agree with you that uh, gold was uh, 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 a solution, a private money, e e even allowing that uh, mints uh, monopolized it. I do think that mints, by monopolizing coinage, caused a lot more trouble than, than you acknowledge, uh, ranging from uh, some s very serious debasements, which did involve inflation, not on a hyperinflation scale, but nevertheless pretty severe in some cases. Also, they've mucked up coinage in other serious ways through bimetallism and that sort of thing. So severe cor coin shortages and poor quality coin were, repeat, were a repeated problem throughout most of the early modern and pre-modern history of coinage. Uh, but uh, having said all that, I still believe that competing paper currency is desirable. I think that here I agree with Mises as well and with Hayek in some of his writings the kind of competing paper currency that works is uh, banknotes that are redeemable, not private fiat money. And uh, of course that means that the monetary base into which the private notes are redeemable has to itself be something that is uh, either naturally scarce or somehow made reliably scarce, which no one has figured out how to do with, with fiat money. Uh, so I think we're, we're in essential agreement about that. I suspect you are uh, less happy than I am with the idea that the supply of, of bank notes can be uh, fractionally backed and uh, can change uh, with, the monopoly, with competitive forces determining the reserve ratios and the quantities, but that's a different issue. So, um, so I think we agree on a lot of things. The problem with the gold standard is, uh, uh, is I think, uh, that of trying to recreate it now that it is gone. And the network of uh, na na nature of money here is part of the problem. I agree with you, money's a network good. This does not mean it can't be competitively supplied. I mean, we have to distinguish between different monetary standards and different producers of money conforming to a common standard. The latter is consistent with money's network properties. So for example, if you, ha you can have dozens of mints pr producing uh, pennies, as long as they conform to the standard. Or uh, you can have many banks producing notes, five pound notes, 10 pound notes, 20 pound notes, as long as they're all consistent with an underlying standard. So you can have competition that's consistent with the network. But um, because of network effects, what you can't have is people finding it convenient to transact in gold when the established standard, uh, the large network that's already in place is now a fiat money network. It's very hard. That's why Bernard Van Nathos's Liberty Dollars can take over you know, <laughs> the U.S. money supply. Um, so you, a spontaneous return to a metallic standard is hardly likely to take place because of these network uh, uh, effects. But that means that it could only happen if the government engineered the return. And then we would have the government involved from the get-go, and why should we expect it to honor the promises it's pretending to recreate? And so uh, there's a real problem. I wish if I had a magic wand and I could wave it and restore the pre-1914 international gold standard, <coughs> right, uh, I would wave it. But I don't have one. Nobody has one. So I don't know how we go back to, to such a standard. First of all, right, let's be fair. If the governments have, throughout most of history, aggressively stamped out any attempts to challenge their currency monopolies, then it's a little bit unfair to say, look, Unless you can show me some examples of successful competing currency systems, then, then I'm going to insist that only state monopoly is this must be the only way to go because otherwise we would have these good examples. Well, of course, that, 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 that argument is, is, uh, is, is, is not a sound argument. I don't, think, I don't mean that that's what you're saying, but there's a, the, the, there, is a, there, there is the fact that we don't have many examples. It's not because they can't work. It's because they're not allowed. But there are some examples. You mostly, though, you have to go back to history. I certainly don't think Zimbabwe is a good example. Right? 
it's not a good example because whatever is there is obviously emerging. It's a, it's, it's a transition to a brand new currency system and uh, out of absolute chaos, right? But we go back with many examples of the Scottish banking system, the Canadian system, of systems where the underlying standard was gold or silver. The, uh, the, the, the paper currency was competitively supplied. And it worked very, very well. You didn't have crises. You didn't have bank failures because you had a sound system of competing banks that all enjoyed equal and considerable privileges, but no monopoly. Uh, and uh, we, we have the record of these systems. They work very well. Now, uh, what those systems didn't involve was comp competition in coinage. Unfortunately, there's no case that I'm aware <coughs> of where you had the competition in bank currency, paper currency, as well as competition in coinage at the same time. That would be nice, but we don't have examples of that. We do have examples, though, of competition in coinage. The California gold rush created a private coinage industry in, on the West Coast in the United States because the U.S. mints were located in Charlotte and Philadelphia, and the government didn't put a branch mint out in California. So private coinage took place, and we know from the coins they were some of those mints produced coins to a better standard than the uh, U.S. mint. Uh, and uh, they flourished until they were suppressed by the government. They flourished after a branch mint was sent up in, in, in San Francisco. They had to be suppressed and one was bought out. The others were outlawed. We have private coinage of token coins in the British Industrial Revolution. I have a whole book about that. It's called Good Money. You can buy it and read it. Or you can even read it without buying it if you prefer. But uh, to talk all about that episode. So there are examples of private production of various types of money that, of course, is quite apart from uh, the examples of uh, production of electronic money, that sort of thing. Private production of the kinds of circulating money that governments have generally monopolized. And there are examples that show that the private sector can manage it very well, given a chance. Because the credit cards don't run into, they don't, they don't attempt to recreate uh, a different, to create a, an alternative monetary standard. Your credit card's just a device for moving dollars around in the U.S. Sorry, pounds here, and uh, and uh, and so uh, it doesn't. It, it's a fully compatible with the existing fiat standard. That is not the case. Uh, that would not be the case of uh, a. Um, say, a gold coin or, a, or uh, any other gold-denominated medium of exchange. So just, just to follow up on that, though, if I go traveling, say, in France, well, yeah, in France, for example, I use my sterling-based American Express card to buy in euros there. Suddenly, we're transacting in two different currencies and two different exchanges. So Yes, you have a different exchange rate, but you're, you're, you're essentially you're making a, a transaction in euros, and then uh, they are... Uh, having a foreign exchange settlement that, uh, that uh, manages the conversion of euros into pounds, vice versa. So, uh, but you're, what you're not trying to do is go to France and shop with pounds. And, uh, and if you tried, you would run into the same problem. If, you, if there wasn't an arrangement with your bank company, et cetera, that there would be all, the, the recipient, the person you're paying at the restaurant in Paris, would not be happy if they got pounds, and they don't get pounds, because your card authority and bank uh, arrange for them to get what they want, and that's the key. Okay. I, I don't know. Okay. I'm one of those economists who doesn't know. Uh, and the reason I don't know is because, uh, well, I mean, like, like all, uh, certainly like most American economists, I'm deeply concerned about the vast expansion of the monetary base. And I think this is also a, a, a problem to a less uh, 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 severe extent, perhaps, in most of the other countries that have been caught up in the recent crisis. On the other hand, uh, I don't know whether the various exit strategies that have been proposed would in fact be put into effect uh, so as to mop up excess currency if the inflation rate, rate got too high. Uh, I have my doubts about their willingness to employ those methods, though they can work in principle. 
Uh, I don't know to what extent spending will pick up uh, despite uh, 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 so many government policies that have hampered recovery and especially by hampering investment. So there's too many imponderables. I've never wanted to be one of those economists who made predictions and then made a point of going around reminding people of everyone that I happen to get right. And there, that's how you become a, 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 a guru in our profession. Uh, I'd, I'd rather just admit that it's not my cup of tea to forecast uh, the future. I can tell you that if the money supply, if spending does revive and the Fed doesn't resort to any of the severe uh, exit strategies that it has put forward, then we are in for a very tough ride. But I don't know if that's what's going to happen. You know, actually, these are good examples. <coughs> Whenever we speak of network effects and network problems, we, we all, it's also important to admit that it, it's, it, the marketplace entrepreneurs have always been able to surprise us at being able to get new networks going despite very well entrenched old networks. So <coughs> the network thing that I've been saying I think would make it difficult to reestablish a gold standard. Here again, I ought to say I don't know because some clever entrepreneur might figure out a way to do it. And indeed, with air miles and also phone minutes, right, which have become a kind of small-scale counter, you know, alternative currency, those are both currencies, if you like to call them that, and again, the scale is very small, that are not standard. They, don't, they are not denominated in standard units. <coughs> they have gained some headway because there's a widespread demand and there's the convenience of this, being able to make a payment with cell phone units. Uh, so. Uh, minutes and that sort of thing. So who knows? Maybe <coughs> I'm all wet. I'm too conservative. If I were an entrepreneur, I might be able to see some of these possibilities better. All I know is that when you're faced with an entrenched monetary standard network, it's an uphill battle. It's going to take uh, quite a lot. And then even so, uh, if the entrepreneurs are successful enough or uh, uh, manage to be successful in this regard, uh, the fact that they're introducing whole new monetary standards itself is no guarantee that the state won't uh, crack down on them uh, <laughs> as if they were medieval counterfeiters. So. so there you are, you can set up a business and you can either make a fortune or end up in the tower. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we've had uh, a 